I just want to thank God right now for you guys. You are faithful. You believe. You are seeking. You desire more of God. You understand the opportunities God puts before you and the things God is trying to change. And you don't run from those things. You know how confident I am about saying this? You know how confident I am about saying this? You know why I can say this with confidence? That you are people of God, that you are sheep and not goats? Because you're here. Because you're here. You desire to hear from God. Nobody made you get up this morning. Nobody made you get up this morning. Even if you got up because you didn't want to make it look bad, that you maybe didn't feel like coming, but you're still here anyway, you're here. And that's ordained by God. Because God calls you and you answered that. However that looks, you answered that. And so I just want to this morning praise God for you. I want to praise God for you. For the unity of believers that come together to hear God's word. You know, last week we talked about know the right gate. Know the right gate you're supposed to enter. Know the instruction. See, the Bible we read last week and we understood that the Bible are our instructions. They are our ticket on this plane. They're our ticket on this train. They tell us what time to arrive. They tell us where to go. But see, when we get to this gate, there's this voice announcer. There's this announcer at the gate that's calling out our number. There are hundreds of other gates probably there that they're calling out to. But see, you hear one. You only hear one. And the reason you hear only that one is because the ticket that you have points you to that one gate. And the only voice you can hear is the one gate voice announcer calling your name. Because if you do, if you go off and get distracted and listen to all the other pretty voice gate announcers that have if different gates where different trains are going out of, guess what? You're going to miss your flight. You're going to miss the train. You're going to miss yours. And God was teaching that to us last week. Jesus is the gate. He is the voice announcer. He is the one that we listen for. Jesus had told the Pharisees and the leaders this last week. But man, they were walking in darkness. They were walking in darkness. Their claim that they could see they claimed that they could see, if you remember, and Jesus said, so your guilt remains given the fact that you say you can see. See, there was no brokenness to that. So at the end of our reading last week, when Jesus tells them, I am the gate, and, and I, am the, I, I, am, I, am, I am the shepherd, the good shepherd, and, and they didn't want, some believed. Some believed. It even says in the word that uh, they were divided. Some did not believe him to be demon possessed. They're not, they are not, uh, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon, they said. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? But others did not, you know, they did believe. So they were divided. The encouragement for us last week was that we know the right gate and that we know the right voice announcer. And in this text today, you know, Jesus doesn't stop. He's in a different place now, though, but he doesn't stop. Turn with me to chapter 10 of the book of John. We're going to read in verse 22. We're going to start off in verse 22. Book of John, chapter 10, verse 22. Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. 
And Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus, his love for his father is so great that his obedience drives him to walk right into the place where he knows he was probably going to get ambushed. You know, I used to, in high school, in, well, actually it was middle school, there was always these bullies. My dad was the principal of the high school, and, uh, or the, the high school and the middle school, and I, I always got bullied. I always got bullied. I was always in fights. I think I told you this almost like every day, right? And, you know, they tease me, eh, pff, no problem. They start teasing my dad, eh, I didn't like that so much. I didn't like that so much, so I would get them fights almost every day because I knew how to turn my trigger, and I didn't care how old they were and how big the guys were, and I was scrawny and skinny, and yeah, I got beat up a lot. <laughs> I got beat up a lot, but one of, the things, one of the things that happened was when these bullies, and I can remember this, this guy, he was an 11th grader, he was a big guy, and, and he didn't like my dad, man, so he didn't like me, and he bullied me a lot. He bullied me a lot, and so I would, uh, he would tell me, you know, after school, you, you know that saying, oh, you get chills. After school, I'm going to meet me after school, or I'm going to catch you after school, and you just, those are the times in my life where I wish school never ended. <laughs> so I was there after school, and I was walking home, and I walked home, and I would get, you know, we would get in a confrontation two or three times, and then he would tell me that again, but see, the third or fourth time, I knew where he was going to be. So I walked all the way around the other part of town to get home. And I never missed, I, I, I missed him completely. And I got home, I would say, Jesus didn't do that. Why do you go to somewhere where you're going to get killed? Why do you want to go somewhere? These guys had already picked up stones twice to kill him. And now he's walking into the very place these guys live, in the temple. Why would you do that? Jesus' love for his Father and his love for you and me is that strong. He's going to go to the places in our life hmm, where it doesn't matter how much. See, sometimes we beat Jesus up in the things that we do, in our disobedience, but he keeps coming. He keeps showing up. Because there's hope. As long as we're breathing, folks, there is hope. Jesus being in this temple at this time was not a mistake. First of all, you see the writer writes, it was winter. John writes, it was winter. Why, why do we care what season it was? This is really strange that he puts right in here as winter. It's because the Bible was not written in English. It was written in a different language, right? Whether it's Greek or Hebrew. And so this text translates the season of death. This was the season of death. Meaning, this was the time that Jesus was going to his death. It was winter, he writes. Second, the feast of dedication. In terms of the part of the year, this part of the year for the Jews, this festival was one of the last festivals they celebrated through the year. You know, it commemorated the purification of the temple, which started after an end to the profaning of the temple by Syrian king um, Antichius. Right, so there was a king that profaned the temple. And so when they came back to the temple, they needed to purify it. And so this was a ceremony that was a purification. Oh, and by the way, the significance of this as Jesus walked in this temple was that, you know, this, this season right now that they're celebrating, it's also called Hanukkah. In today's age, it's called Hanukkah. It's a festival of lights, Here's the ironic thing and the significance of Hanukkah and the festival of lights. Jesus is the light of the world. 
Jesus has been claiming that he's the light of the world. He is the final purification for us, for our sins, for the bondage of sin. So there was a huge significance. This was not a happenstance. This, this was a sign for these people to wake up because he keeps saying, I am the light. I am the light of the world. I am the son of God. And now he shows up at this time and he's here during this, this season of lights that they celebrate and the purification. Here they basically trap him though and they ask him question. They ask him a question, and the question in my text actually says, how long will you keep us in suspense? But again, the Bible was not written in English, and so the translation of that in actual translation, literal translation is, how long are you going to take our life? How long are you going to keep annoying us? How many of you in, in, in your lives, with, maybe with kids, maybe with friends, I don't know, um, they annoy you? I mean, come on. It happens, right, that things annoy us, right? They annoy us. Maybe a song, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it, uh, this, this word annoying is really our way of saying, quit taking away my time, I don't, I have better things to do with my time. See, this thing that they were talking about was, why are you taking away my life? You see, the Jews were convicted to the core. These leaders were convicted to the core, which, by the way, is a good thing, because without conviction, there really is no opportunity to change. I'll say it again. Without conviction, there is no opportunity to change. The definition of conviction is the state of being convinced of error or compelled to admit the truth. They wanted to keep their life. They had, which was really, they were living in death. They were living in death without the acknowledging and belief that Jesus was the Son of God, which according to John 3, whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life, he says. They felt like Jesus wanted to take away what they had, in essence, taking away their life. They were waiting for a Savior. Yes, they were waiting for a Savior. They had expectations about what that Savior might be. Their expectations were wrong, though, so they became blind to God's response to this cry for help that they had. You know, I um, had a nephew that has passed on now. But there were times in my life when I was sitting there late at night or early in the morning, doesn't matter, and I'd get a phone call. And he was in a bad way. He was in a bad way. He had some problems with drugs, and he was in a bad way. And so he would ask me to take him to the hospital or whatever, and I would get up, And I would take him to the hospital. I would go pick him up, take him to the hospital, feed him something to get some food in his system before he got there. And we would get there. And when we got there, the minute they called him, I'm good. Let's go home. I'm good. See, the Jews were crying out for God. They were in bondage. They were in, they were being oppressed by the Roman government. They wanted to be free and they knew God was going to bring a savior. See, my nephew knew that he needed a savior. He wanted to be saved. He wanted to be helped. But when he measured and understood what that meant to get to the other end, no, I don't want it. See, we got to get to the end of ourselves before God can help us. And the Jews weren't there yet. They didn't, they had cried out to God. But Jesus didn't take away their life. See, Jesus did not come to take away their life. Jesus came to give life. Even the life that they had, even the life that you have, even the life that we try to get away from, He doesn't come to take that from us. We have to give that to Him. 
Because only when we give that life can we receive what God has for us. As he's been doing with the Jews and then he does now with us, Jesus offers something more that we might have eternal life. And it is not to us to accept this and freely give up the life of death we've lived in all our lives. The life of death we used to believe in. That's what he wants us to give. We give it up for a renewed mind and a heart that God has promised. And that's what he wanted them to do. And he tells them this. And, and you know, they remember the scriptures. And we remember the scriptures. That's why it's so important for us to remember the scriptures. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this. I will give you a new heart and to put a, a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Has God done that to you today? Has God done that to us in our life? See, Jesus does not take away what we have. He offers what is better, and when the eyes of our hearts are open to who He is, the Son of God, we freely give up the life we have for the new life, and through the new heart He gives us, begins to change us. And we freely respond to Him as His sheep, as He is the shepherd. Jesus is the giver of life, folks, but now, both now and more importantly for us, eternally. We don't go to churches fried chicken to get a, our car fixed. We don't go to Joe's auto shop for an evening out on the town and for dinner. That sounds ludicrous, right? Just like we don't go to the world for the things of life. We go to the giver of life, and that's Jesus. We don't go to other places for life. We go to God. We don't go to the world for life. So he's trying to tell them this. I, he, he's, he's trying, this, this whole thing is, a, is an exemplification of, I, I'm not trying to take away your life. These, these guys were saying that, but they were convicted to the core. We know they were convicted. Why? Because they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him. And then he goes on, verse 25. Jesus answered, I did tell you. After they had asked him, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus says, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You see, the Jews knew God through his historical miracles, through Moses and through others, all the prophets, that the, the parting of the Red Sea, the manna, the water, uh, the, the plagues when they came out of Egypt. They knew of these historical events. They knew that God, God had revealed himself to these people through these miracles. The way they knew God was by history and by these miracles. So you wonder why Jesus continues to press. If you don't believe me because of what I say, believe at least the miracles. He presses this for a purpose. He presses this to say, guys, wake up. Don't you remember God, the one that you believe in, created these miracles, did these miracles for you and for the people. He did this. Now I am doing this right before you, and you say, who can heal a blind man? I am the Son of God. If you don't believe me telling you, at least believe in the miracles. See, sometimes we become people who believe in what we see and not what we don't see. And so Jesus was using everything in his arsenal directed by his father to try to get those to believe. Verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, 
is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. See, Jesus, Jesus again speaks of his sheep as he did last week. His sheep listen to him. They follow his voice because they know and believe he is who he says he is. Not only do they know Jesus, but Jesus knows them. Jesus gives them protection, eternal life, security, never perishing. For the Jews, Jesus was speaking, to, saying this meant eternity with and return to God. The very God they claimed to worship. Jesus made it clear in verse 29 and 30 that no one, not even those who claim to have authority on earth. I want you to hear this because this is for us this morning. Jesus in verse 29 and 30, he's, he says that no one, not even those who claim to have authority on earth. How do we know that? Because he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to the leaders of the Jewish leaders. These are the Jewish leaders that claim to have authority on earth. Not even they can dictate the sheep's relationship and, or salvation with God and this through Jesus Christ, right? They could not take away their identification as belonging to God. And so no one can take that security and title away from them. They cannot be snatched from the security and the hand of God. I want us to think about that for a second. I want us to take that in to us for a second. I want, to, I want us to take it in through our ears, in through our mind, and into our hearts. See, this eternity that God is talking about, this security that the Lord is speaking of, this, this uh, 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 protection, if you will, that God is speaking about, it's an eternal security. That basically means that as we walk in this world, as sheep, let me qualify that, as we walk in this world as sheep, He's got you right in His hand. The wind's blowing, and He's got you in His hand. The rain's coming. You're getting wet, but you're right in His hand. The tornadoes come and start throwing debris at you and hitting you, and it hurts, but you're right in His hand. There's nothing... There is nothing, did I say nothing? I really meant nothing that is going to take you out of his hand. So if you physically go from this world, you go right in his hand. I don't know about you, but... but I don't like death necessarily. I get it physically and mentally. I get it emotionally. I get it. I get the pains of this world. But that there, I don't know about you, but that there, what do we really have to worry about? For those who truly believe Jesus is the Son of God and His sheep, as He identified by Jesus Himself in this passage, they should, this should be comforting to them. No one can take them out of His hand. Do you realize that you and I, catch me here, you and I, are our worst enemies. The only one that can take you out of Christ's hand is you. Is you. Not your friends that put you down. Not the world that makes you feel victimized. Mm -mm. No. The Word says... I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. No one can snatch them out of my hand. 
See, this security and love for Jesus leads to obedience and is how we are able to do the very things Jesus encourages us to do as his sheep. This whole security. In Matthew 5 and 6, you can read the Beatitudes there. He talks about how, see, this security and this, this essence of, of knowing that, you know, when we feel pretty good about ourselves or we feel comfortable and we feel safe, nothing really bothers us often. It's when we don't feel safe that we start to get a little anxious and, and things like that in our life. We know that because we've all experienced it. See, but when, when God says, I've got you right in my hand and nobody's going to snatch you from my hand, you are my sheep. And, and we, we understand that it is through obedience our obedience to God that we are his sheep because his sheep follow, his sheep listen, his sheep obey. And we know as long as we obey that he, we, we are right in his hand. See, when that stuff happens, we can, as Matthew 5 and 6, be the light of Jesus to others because we're not inwardly focused. See, we, Matthew 5 and 6 again, chapter 5 and 6 says, turn our hearts and thoughts away from lust. See, because we don't need that stuff. We've got a security that people don't understand. See, we understand how to behave in, this, in the uh, sanctity of marriage where Jesus talks about divorce. Because our marriage is not about getting. Our marriage is not about getting. Our marriage is not about getting. Our marriage is about giving. It's about giving. Then he says... Do not be not to be vengeful, but rather love those who hate us or treat us badly. That's all part of the Beatitudes as well. You cannot treat others well that have treated you badly without understanding that God's got you in his hand. He's got you in his hands, and you're his sheep, and his sheep behave a certain way. The Beatitudes go on and say, give of our wealth or poverty to those in need. See, we can't tithe. If we don't understand our security in God's hands, we can't tithe. We won't tithe. It's our money. We are scared. We are afraid of what's going to happen. We're afraid that we're not going to have money to pay our bills. We're going to afraid we don't have money to do this or to do that. We, we, our security becomes this very thing that God says, you cannot worship both God, you cannot serve both God and money. But when you in God's hands... What's money? It's the purpose for money in God's hands is for you and me and us to do the work of the kingdom. Whatever that might be. See, and then he goes on and says, don't allow our hearts to treasure anything here on earth more than God, especially the temptation for money. I just explained that. And then he goes on and he says in the Beatitudes, in my hand, right, forgive Forgive others. That's one thing that I know a lot of people have trouble with. Somebody's wronged you or, or, or somebody... Forgiveness is hard for some people. But Jesus says, forgive. And he says, don't worry about our lives, but rather put the kingdom of God first. How can you put the kingdom of God first when you got this problem and this problem and that problem and this problem and that problem? Sound like somebody's life right about now? Why? How? Because I've got you right in my hand. Because I've got you right in my hand. You see, Jesus is telling the Pharisees that they were not his sheep. He, especially as he claimed his oneness with his father, this was a slap in the face to the Pharisees and the religious leaders who believed they had the key and no one could come to God except through them. See, they're the ones that offered the sacrifices. They're the ones that did the prayers. They're the ones that did all these things for the people. And so in their thinking, they were the judges, and they judged as they saw fit, which was unrighteously, which was biasly, which was poorly, according to Jesus. In the Wesleyan Bible commentary that I was reading said that the great difference between Jesus and the Pharisees was not that they held one set of beliefs and, and Jesus had another, but rather that he was morally in earnest about the beliefs and he lived those as though they were really so. 
See, talking about what you believe, talking about that I believe, I believe, I believe, and what you do, how you doing? How are we doing with that? See, this is what Jesus was, this is why they were upset with Jesus. And the commentary goes on to say that um, speaking the words and doing the deeds of God while boldly flouted, flouting the traditions of the elders. He was flouting the traditions of the elders because the traditions were for nothing more than to show their power. Jesus could have healed this man and others on any other time of the week. But the ordained will of God was that this would happen on the Sabbath so that the miracles of compassion and healing would bring light to darkness. When the Lord works in the life of those He is trying to save, it is often in those areas where we live in the legal to bring light to the darkness of this legal living as he reveals the light of compassion, true morality, and love as God would have it. This is what was happening between the Jewish leaders and Jesus, and for this, they wanted to kill him. Verse 31. Again, the Jews picked up stones so that they could play marbles with him. No. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. These weren't rubber stones. These weren't play rocks like in a movie. They were stones, folks. And there was a rebuilding of the temple and probably reconstruction going on around according to the time. And there were stones around. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from my Father, for which one of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not Written in your law, I have said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am God's son? Do you not believe me unless I do what? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, Even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles. Here he goes again. Believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. You see, the miracles were not the problem. Jesus' healing of the men and women What appeared to be the compassion of Jesus for those the Jews so often ignored. Yeah, you got to remember that the people that Jesus was, was curing were the people that the Jews ignored. They were the lepers that they outcasted. They were the blind that they didn't pay attention to. See, Jesus was curing the very people that the Jews did not pay attention to. But that's not the issue here. That's only part of the problem. The issue was that Jesus was calling himself the Son of God, making himself equal with the one the Jews claimed to serve. And so because they couldn't really do anything about the compassion for the people, which was making them look bad for fear of the people, they then addressed the letter of the law. When they couldn't do this, they went to this, and it was the letter of the law. And the letter of the law was said, you do not work on the Sabbath. And we talked about this before, and I gave you permission. If you want to go to do a good deed on the, on the Sabbath, fine, do it. If you want to give me money on the Sabbath, do it. It's a good deed. I'm kidding. But you get what I'm saying. It, it, it was, we don't take the time on, if we see somebody on the street that's hurting on a Sabbath, on a Sunday, you don't pass by and say, hey, it's Sunday, take care 
Jesus was trying to tell him, you have this legality about you. you. You hold on to this law. We had a, a pastor. There was a pastor before that uh, had a heart for the people. Oh, he had a heart for the people. And, and he wanted to reach out to the lost because of where he had come from. Man, he'd come from some bad stuff. And this pastor was a loving pastor. And he wanted, he wanted some things for his people. And from the in, I wasn't in this, but from the outside, I could see things that were happening. God had opened my eyes to some things. And what had happened was uh, he wanted to feed people. He wanted to bring them in. And he wanted to have a steak and lobster dinner. And he wanted to happen that, have that steak and lobster dinner, not outside. He wanted to have it in the sanctuary. Oh, the pushback he got. Who? The sanctuary is sacred. It's sacred. You can't do those types of things in the sanctuary. You see... They, they, they used the Leviticus 26.2 text. You know, observe my Sabbath and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. See, with the sanctuary that he, Jesus is talking about, God's talking about is us. We are the sanctuary. We are so stinking concerned about the building and about the carpet and about the chairs and about everything around us. We get so concerned and consumed about those things sometimes and we forget that this building is nothing. We are the sanctuary. God doesn't live in buildings anymore. He lives in us. And so many people Many people, some of the wealthy people left the church. A lot of people left the church. But see, through that outreach type of thing, the church grew one more time. The church grew one more time. And in fact, there were claims to say things like this. And don't you believe it for a second because it is not true. People would say things like that. You cannot grow a church on poor people. You cannot grow a church on, on poor people. But see, that's what the church is for. That's what the church is for. The Jews were using this legality to trap him. And Jesus was trying to open their eyes. He was trying to, I am the law. I am the law. I did not come to break any of the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them, he says in Matthew. See, the Most High doesn't live in houses made by men. Christ dwells in our heart, according to Ephesians 3.17. Many that were concerned left the church, but see... What happened was a lot of those poor people became part of the church. They accepted Jesus Christ, and as a result of that acceptance, do you realize that many of those people that came through that ministry are now pastoring in other parts of the country and in other cities? It is amazing what happened. He, ro he, he raised up. He raised up from the ashes Pastors that went to California, pastors that went to Texas, pastors that went down to Rio Doso, pastors that went to other places, opened up a couple of other churches, bought a property. God is, God doesn't do things like we do. He just doesn't do things like we do. He is a good God. And Jesus was trying to help them understand this. See, in verses 34 through 36, and trying to make it clear who he is and, and who they are, if they are truly sheep, Jesus responds to them using their own scriptures about the God. Psalms 82. Psalms 82 speaks about this. 
He was calling them, I have said, you are gods. And if, if God calls them gods who are, who are men, then what about the one that he sent, he's telling them. And you're telling me that I'm blaspheming. Psalms 82 says, God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods, little g. That, those are human judges, by the way. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about, they walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Then he says, I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. See, this was the scripture that Jesus was referring to, and they knew this scripture. Your own scriptures tell you. And what he's trying to emphasize here is that he is the Son of God. And they call him, they say he's blaspheming. Well, it, have you not seen the miracles that I have done? And if you don't believe in the miracles, I'm the Son of God. You know, in Luke 132, the archangel Gabriel actually gave him that title. Jesus is given this same title. It says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. He is the Son of God. Now, because they, they see the miracles and they are convinced to the core, they're convicted to the core, there are some things the Jews are going to have to admit to change. And this, folks, is where it all really starts for them and for us. See, the foundational understanding... And the foundational belief that He is the Son of God is where it all starts. But Jesus had brought them from this point and began to drill down through their questions. He answered them. He responded to them. And He drilled down to the... You know, it's almost like a funnel. And there down at the end is a very small little hole now. And only so much can go through that hole now. Everything else has been drained out. And so, when there are no more questions... When there are no more... The, the heart has to make a decision, folks... When Jesus brings us to a point of decision, that is the last part of the funnel. When we have no more questions to ask, when He has convinced us and He has convicted us right before Him and His Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, we got no more questions to ask. One of two things is going to happen. See, the, the Jews are asking, where do the true answers to these questions really lead us? If we admit that they are true. See, as Jesus was trying to get them to understand, and as Jesus speaks to us today, this morning, we must ask ourselves, are the consequences of rejecting Him greater than the consequences of accepting Him? The answer will depend on whether we believe that He is a Son of God or not, just like the Pharisees. For the Pharisees, they had to ask themselves some, some questions. And I know it's not in here, but man, if I were them, and it's life for us, you, uh, where would this leave them in terms of their authority, in terms of their stature amongst the people, their reputation? How, how could this change their lifestyle, the food they received from the tent of the sacrifices that people give, the living off the money of the Jews that people paid to temple taxes and other things? Where would this leave them? How, how would this change everything they've even believed in, have they, everything they've been, have taught, everything they have taught, everything they've practiced, the way that people look at them? How would this change? You know, although there is nothing wrong with the questions and they should be something... You know, this should be something contemplated because Jesus does tell us in Luke 14 that we should weigh the cost. 
The question of whether to believe Jesus in terms of who he says he is must be answered and admitted to before anything else can start. When someone has an authentic encounter with Jesus, it's not the miracles and the good he does that upsets us. See, we don't get upset at Jesus curing illnesses. Nobody gets upset because Jesus cures an illness in our life. We don't get upset at Jesus going ahead of us on a job interview and and leading the way and we get the job. See, we, we don't get upset when God and Jesus, as long as he comes through the way we expect him to come through, the way we think he should come through. We are never upset with Christ for those things. See, the Jews weren't upset for the healings. Rather, we get upset when he begins to show us things in our life that we need to change after we accept him. But then he reminds us through his scripture, through sermons, through Bibles reading, like he did with the Jewish friends here, I am the son of God. And now because it is that he is the son of God who is asking us to change these things in our life, promising us eternal life, we understand that the life he offers can only be accepted if we truly believe. And if we truly believe, we will obey his voice and his commands. This is when we either want to kill him or we want to embrace him. If you ever walk out of an encounter with Jesus, if you ever walk away from an encounter with Jesus in ambivalence, meaning it doesn't matter one way or the other, you've not had an encounter with Jesus. If you walk away from an encounter with Jesus convicted, or you walk away from an encounter with Jesus broken, there's a good chance you've had an encounter with Jesus. But see, this this whole thing about coming to Christ, coming to church, coming, whatever you want to call it, reading the Bible and walking away. Unfazed is untrue. When we have an encounter with the Holy God, something's got to give. Something's got to give. This is when we have this encounter when we either want to kill him, and by killing him, he's already physically dead. He lives, right? He lives and there's nothing. He's conquered death. So what, by killing him, let me, let, me put this, let me put handles on this. We're talking about ignoring the word of God. And to go on living our life the way we want to live our life, despite what anybody tells us. We're talking about putting it off and saying, oh, well, maybe I'll just change later. We say accepting it initially, but when it gets hard because of our selfish nature, we begin to believe it's not possible. And when the word continues to come at us about the possibility, when Jesus, through his love, continues to show us the possibilities, we don't want to accept this. We want to kill the messenger, and thus we want to kill him. See, anybody who brings the word of God When you insult them, you're not insulting them. You're insulting God. Or when we have a personal encounter with Jesus, we embrace him as the son of God, and his will is our desire. We stop asking the question in our hearts, is he really who he says he is? We stop questioning his authenticity. And accept his authority, graciousness, his mercy, his justice, his righteousness. And we begin to allow him to identify the things in our lives that he desires to change. That we might be true children of God. However, although no one and no thing can rob Christ of his followers... For he and the Father are one, and his word says that. A disciple can cease to follow if he chooses. We cannot be protected against ourselves in spite of ourselves. 
We cannot be protected against ourselves in spite of ourselves. Meaning our souls are only protected by God as we are obedient to God. John 14, 23 tells us, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my command, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. See, the giver of life drives us to a decision, and that's what he wanted these guys to do. He didn't want to stop the conviction in their hearts. He didn't want to pacify this thing. Sometimes we talk to people and we want to pacify the conversation. He didn't want to pacify the conversation. He wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to be saved. Oh, but Pastor Michael, you've got you to gotta do it this way. You've got to smooth into it, right? I mean, some people can't be talked to like that. You've got to talk to them this way. Well, you've got to do this. Jesus didn't care. Jesus, that wasn't his objective. To bring light to darkness is always going to hurt our eyes. It's always going to hurt our eyes. The giver of life brings us to a decision in our life. And this is what he was trying to do to the Jews. And this is what he's trying to do for us today. And then he says, verse 40, the word tells us, Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John, they're talking about John the Baptist, all that John said about this man was true, and in that place many believed in Jesus. See, Jesus returning to this place where John had been baptizing, this is not an accident. He didn't, like, not have any other place to go. This wasn't an accident. It was a place where he had begun his ministry. It was a place where he had been anointed by the Holy Spirit the, the, that God had put on him. It was a place where God, his Father, had said to him in a voice from heaven, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. See, for those who are sheep, his sheep, these verses, 40 through 42, are the answer to the opposition and struggle with the things we've talked about. They're the answer in the opposition, to the opposition of the things we talked about. For those who are his sheep, it's necessary for us in life, like our Savior did here, when we are in times of tribulation and opposition of the things that fight against us, fight against our sanctification, that we return in our memory, or maybe even physically, to those places where we remember we were filled with the Holy Spirit. We remember and we return to those places. It's necessary we return to the place in our minds and our hearts, maybe even again, like I said, physically, where we remember our acceptance of Jesus in our lives and the promises He's given us to be overcomers, that we might not be given into temptations and the temptation to give up, the temptation to return to what it was before. I'm only being real here. There have been times in my life where I wanted to just call it quits because sometimes it got hard. And I had to return to the place where I was sitting in that sanctuary and God called upon me. He told me who I was before Him. He had shown me everything that I'd done in my past and how bad and perverted and putrid my life really was. And He forgave me. He forgave me. Jesus went back to that place. See, when we get in our times of problems, when we get in those places where we just don't know what we're going to do, we have to have that place where we go back to. For those who are not His sheep, it's necessary that we come to the end of ourselves. 
where we have tried every angle to fill the void and we have nowhere else to turn, that we would then come to the gate, to the right gate, come to the good shepherd. Because every sheep has his or her conversion, calling experience, if you will. And if we don't, we can never say, like the song says, do it again. Through this message this morning um, and over the course of the last month, you know, he continues just to tell us, folks, it all starts with us believing that he's the son of God. It all starts with our believing he is who he says he is. He's not just Jesus, but he is Jesus living in us. He is Christ living in and through us. This is one reason we celebrate communion, which is what we're going to do this morning. That we might remember, that we might be reminded. As we think about our message today of being His sheep and listening to His voice, the communion we partake of together should remind us that this sacrament of communion is a proclamation of our belief that He is the Son of God. See, If my children do not believe that I am their father, why would they listen? If my children did not believe that I would give them food or give them as they were going up money, why would they believe in me? If we do not believe that He is the Son of God, we will never obey Him. If you are struggling, if we struggle with disobedience, if we struggle with our attitudes, if we struggle with unforgiveness, if we struggle with those things in our life, despite the fact that our Word tells us that we should not do that, do not worry, He says. He tells us that if you are at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, not that you have something against your brother, but that your brother has something against you, maybe you did something and you didn't know about it but maybe you're not even in the wrong he says go to your brother see if we do not believe he is the son of God we will not obey him so if we do not obey him all that means is that we don't believe he's the son of God see because when you when you put him in that category of the son of God the son of the Most High, the son that, di- the son that did all these miracles, the son of God, then nothing becomes impossible for him. Nothing becomes impossible when he lives in and through us. Nothing becomes impossible. Because he's got us right in his hand. And our eternity is secure. We are safe. Are you feeling safe this morning? Are you feeling safe this morning? Do you believe he's the son of God? <laughs> See, as we think about this message, communion is a proclamation of our belief that he's the son of God. We proclaim his life. We proclaim his sufferings. We proclaim his sacrificial death and resurrection. We proclaim the hope of his coming again. We proclaim our repentance and forsaking of sin and our belief in Christ for our salvation. And we do this in unity of heart, mind, and spirit. As we partake of this sacrament this morning, I encourage us to be reminded of the fact that He is the Son of God. He did come to man, as man, to walk among and teach us. He did die on the cross for our sin. He was resurrected and now lives. And because we believe this, Jesus lives in us and we believe He is the Son of God, 
Does this proclamation bear witness in our lives? Does this proclamation bear witness in our life, in how we live? If not, it can and it should. Before we take this communion, I want us to think about this and what we're taking in because when we take this in, we make a proclamation that we believe He is the Son of God and all the implications that come with that. If we take this communion knowing there's something in our heart, knowing that there's something between us and God, that is keeping us from believing that He is the Son of God, then we take this communion in vain. And we take this communion in vain. But see, that's between you and God. So this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity, give us as a congregation an opportunity to repent of the things that we know we struggle with. Because we need a Savior. When we think we don't need a Savior, it's when we have a problem. We need a Savior. And none of us are any better than the other. Those who walk in His light and have no repentance necessary in their heart, that's only because they're broken all the time. Those that need Jesus and need to repent before taking this communion, are the ones that Jesus is really looking for this morning. The lost sheep, not the ones that he already has. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take five minutes. Take five minutes, and I'd like you, everyone's eyes to be closed, every head bowed, every head bowed and every eye closed. And I want you to, I want us to listen to the Holy Spirit. Is there something in your life that would keep you from taking this communion? Is there something in their life that, that would keep you from defiling this communion that we're going to be taking? If so, I want you to come to the altar. I want you to pray. I want us to pray. Yes, Lord. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. holy. Thank you. Oh God, we want to do right by you, Lord. Jesus, search our hearts. Search them deeply, Lord. Let there be no sin in your camp. Jesus. Move, Holy Spirit, move. We pray. Jesus. Change our hearts, Lord. Jesus. Holy God. 
Remove our pride, Father. Crush us, Lord. Jesus. That we might be pure like your temple, Father. Let us celebrate the purification of light, Lord. Pastor Joshua. We are going to take communion this morning. And again, folks, I encourage you, understand the sanctity of what we do today. It is not communion that saves us, but it's a proclamation of that we believe what we, that we do what we say we believe in. And that's Jesus. Falling doesn't make us failures, folks. It helps us to realize we need a Savior. It happens. Thank God we have a Savior. Come and receive communion and hold on to it and we will partake of it together. Come. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who's died for our sins. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Amen. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus who died for our sin. Jesus, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus who died for our sin and is resurrected and lives now. Thank you, Lord body and blood of our Lord Jesus body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ body and blood of our Lord Jesus the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us thank you Lord the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ yes thank you Lord Jesus the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. By taking of this, Lord God, we identify your sacrifice, Lord. We identify your change in our lives, Father. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus body and blood of our Lord Jesus, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, dear Lord, thank you, Father, thank you for your sacrifice, Lord, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Thank you, Father. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord God, for your body, for it being broken, for a brokenness that reflects the fact that we need to be broken, Lord. Death must come before life and resurrection can happen. Thank you for your body, Father. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you for your blood, Lord God. Helps us to remember that you were flesh. And because you overcame, we can too, because you live in us now. We proclaim this this morning. We proclaim your coming again. We proclaim your coming again to, to get your sheep, Lord God. And we know that you will separate the sheep and the goat. I pray we meditate on this a little bit, Lord. That we take this very seriously and soberly, Father. Thank you for your flesh and your blood that tells us, Lord God, in human form, you were able to overcome sin. Thank you, Father. We praise your name, Lord. Remember that God, the giver of life, Jesus, drives us to a decision. And if he hasn't, then there could be that opportunity. Amen? Amen. Go in God's peace, and um, we love you. Have a good day.